Vincent Kennedy McMahon. Is there any name as intertwined with the wrestling industry as these three words? Well, four if you count Junior, and if you ignore one, two, three, or one more match, or what, 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 three times over, but you know, I'm just getting off track here. Vince is a living legend within the WWE. The man is responsible for its glorious highs and bottoming lows, and you don't serve 50 years on TV without building up a few stories here and there. And as we eke closer and closer every year to a time without the outspoken spokesperson of the house that Body Oil built, it becomes an ever more scary thought. How will anyone run the business like him? Should they even try and run things like he does? Well, today we're going to go in-depth to look at some facts about the man behind the McMahon, because this wild, bar-biting, god-fighting, oh why do they give the fiends matches different lighting head of the company, simply needs to be studied if we're ever going to understand the product he puts out each week. Week. With this in mind, I'm Jules, this is WhatCulture.com, and these are 25 things that you didn't know about Vince McMahon. Number 25. He didn't meet his father until he was 12. Often referred to as the grandfather of WWE, Vince McMahon Sr. will forever remain embedded into the fabric of the company's history despite the far more vital role Vince Jr. played in its modernization and final form. Though bonded by blood, the two didn't actually connect until McMahon turned 12. McMahon Sr. separated from McMahon mother Vicky when he was just a wee babby, taking the chairman's older brother and separating the family as a result. Their coming together years later was the first of several. McMahon immediately got his father's bug for wrestling and would eventually make it back there after a string of difficult false starts. Such as, number 24, he was court-martialed at military school. In an effort to try and curb his increasingly wild teenage behaviour, military school was supposed to placate a young Vince, but instead only played to his thirst for madness. And as you might be expecting, yes, Vince of course got court-martialed for something weird. In fact, it's the most Vince thing that he could have gotten in trouble for, he even relayed the story himself. I wasn't caught for some stuff that would have meant immediate dismissal, like stealing the commander's car. Colonel Zinnaker had an old green beat-up Buick and he always left the keys in it. He also had a dog that he was nuts about. I love animals, but one day I couldn't resist giving that dog a laxative. I put the laxative in some hamburger and the dog did its business all over the command commander's apartment, which thrilled me greatly. Oh, Vince. Number 23, his mother is still alive. Something of a cult favourite bit of wrestling trivia this, and as of writing still true, his mother Vicky Askew is 98 years old and well on her way to three figures. And as recently as 2014, she spoke on camera regarding the opening of a new tennis club funded by the McMahon family themselves. Number 22, he grew up on a trailer park. It's hard to imagine Vince McMahon as anything but high rises, hotels and horrible suits, but his life before wrestling stood in stark contrast to the one that he eventually became famous for. Born in 1945, Vinnie Lupton was raised by his mother and a number of different stepfathers in a North Carolina trailer. Detailing it for a 2001 interview with Playboy, he said, A new moon trailer, eight feet wide. A trailer park isn't poverty, you don't have much privacy, but there are nice things about it. Everything is compact and it beats some other places. Prior to that, I lived in North Carolina in a house with no indoor plumbing. That could get a little disconcerting in the wintertime. Number 21. He went bankrupt before WrestleMania. McMahon has often told the story of gambling everything on the breakout success of the inaugural WrestleMania, but the 1985 spectacle came after his first financial collapse. Speaking in 2001, he detailed just how close he came to the house of cards falling down around him. It was visions of sugar plums. It was, look how successful I am. I guess I really am someone. I got involved with people who weren't that bright and let them tell me that I needed tax shelters. There was a construction company, a horse farm, a cement plant, and it all went belly up. I felt bad about the bankruptcy. I wanted to pay what I owed, but there were other people involved. And finally, the banks wrote it all off. Number 20. He wanted to kill his abusive stepfather. Back to Playboy once more. Afraid it's more interviews, though, which I'm sure is when we all bought the magazine right this time, though. It's about... Let me just uh, check my notes here. Oh... Oh, it's about the time that Vince wanted to kill his stepfather. Brilliant. Okay, here's the quote. My parents got divorced and I went with my mum, Vicky. She was in the church choir. A real performer, a female Elmer Gantry. Very striking, with an excellent voice. Lived with her and my real asshole of a stepfather, a man who enjoyed kicking people around, Leo Lupton. It's unfortunate that he died before I could kill him. I would have enjoyed that. Okay, Vince. 
Number 19. He once alluded to allegedly being sexually abused by his mother. Seeing as Playboy seems to have had the most exposing interview in the world, we're back there again because whilst explaining his difficult upbringing, the reporter prodded Vince thanks to a comment that he left hanging. And just to warn you, it gets pretty dark. Playboy. Was the abuse all physical or was there sexual abuse too? Vince McMahon. That's not anything I would like to embellish just because it was weird. Playboy. Did it come from the same man? Vince McMahon. No, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't from the male. Playboy. That's so mysterious, it sounds like a difficult thing for a kid to deal with. We can leave that topic. But one thing first. You've said that the sexual abuse in your childhood wasn't from the male. It's well known that you're estranged from your mother. Have we found the reason? McMahon. Without saying that, I'd say that's pretty close. Number 18. He debuted on WWWF television in 1969. After pestering father Vince McMahon Sr. for ages about joining the family business, his dad finally gave him the chance to step into the fray as a TV host for the then WWWF All Star Wrestling TV product. He was permitted the placement after first graduating East Carolina University with a business degree. And it wasn't an easy job, from carrying segments to being screamed at on the regular. Vince paid his dues before even thinking about asking for anything more, and has gone on to tally up a 50-year career on camera as a result. Say what you will about the man, but he was bloody patient. Number 17. He'd barely been touched on screen for nearly 30 years before his first Stone Cold Stunner. McMahon's iconic and iconically awful-looking first Stone Cold Stunner at Madison Square Garden in September 1997 wasn't just impactful because it coincided with the rise of the next megastar and waiting Steve Austin, it was also because Vince had managed to get by as a commentator without any of the talent roughhousing him. Lou Albano was the first to lay his hands on McMahon, taking out Vince during an interview in 1977. Next to get him was Andre the Giant on a 1985 edition of Tuesday Night Titans, but the next three eclipsed the first two by some margin. In 1991, a flailing Roddy Piper waffled him with a wooden chair, believing him to be Ric Flair after The Nature Boy had caused chaos. In 1993, Randy Savage sent him flying to the ground as he tried to get to his former friend Chris and finally, there was Bret Hart's legendary shove on the WrestleMania 13 Go Home Raw show. Number 16. McMemphis Everyone always thinks that the McMahon character was born to combat a rising megastar in Stone Cold Steve Austin, plying his slime to quell and crush the bionic redneck at every turn. But you might be surprised to learn that he was already playing this heelish foil five years earlier than in the WWE for the USWA. Travelling to Jerry Lawler's Memphis locale, the WWE announcers swapped roles to become the bad guys and saw the likes of Bret Hart, Randy Savage, Tatanka, and others joining Vince in a hostile takeover angle and going up against the, at the time, super baby face of Jerry Lawler and pals. Number 15. He actually appreciates good wrestling. Now here's the thing, Vince does have a pretty bad rep for pushing, well, pretty bad wrestling onto our TV each and every week. But in a huge defense of this man, it's not actually the in-ring work that fans don't resonate with. It's when the bollock storytelling takes over that things drop off the cliff. And then when you think about it, Vince has managed to develop a style that's safer, more marketable, and while not involving huge amounts of crazy like some of the indies do, it is providing quality matches up and down the card. And if the following story is to be believed, he actually really despises bad wrestling. Upon witnessing the truly wretched Diesel vs British Bulldog main event from the equally awful In Your House number no. 4 in October 1995, he was caught by ringsiders exclaiming, horrible, as he threw down his headset to the floor in disgust once the show had gone off air. So for as much as he'd helped promote this rancid headliner, that doesn't mean that he was happy with what he'd just witnessed. Number 14. He hates sneezing. First confirmed by then ex-employee Paul Heyman before Stephanie McMahon herself confirmed it, the chairman has an irrational hatred of sneezing because, in Heyman's own words, it's the ultimate Vince control story. He gets really pissed off because he can't control the sneeze. That is both hilarious and terrifying. Number 13. He loves the boogeyman. Perhaps not that surprising considering what we already know about his taste, corporate tycoon Vince McMahon absolutely loves the absurdity of the boogeyman character. This was all confirmed during an RF shoot interview where it was revealed that McMahon loved it so much that he would sneak up behind Falk with the coming to get ya line before darting off into the darkness like the monster from under the bed himself. Number 12. 
He was shocked by women's MMA before signing Ronda Rousey. Revealed by CM Punk, along with just about every other bit of dirty laundry the voice of the voiceless wanted to air during his infamous Art of Wrestling podcast interview with former best friend Colt Cabana, McMahon was apparently quite put out by the prospect of women's MMA. All the while, Ronda Rousey was reinventing the industry atop UFC as its number one draw. As Punk recalled Vince saying, Phil, did you know that they're going to have women fight in the octagon soon? And I replied, yeah, and it's going to be the f coolest thing in the world and it's going to be the hottest f thing you'll see. History proved him right as always and Vince was, as ever, behind the curve. Thankfully, he caught on to the crossover appeal and Ronda Rousey proved to be the surprise that the WWE never knew it needed. Number 11. The name of his yacht. It's called The Sexy Bitch. The Sexy Bitch. Number 10. He didn't know Asian pornography existed. Okay, I'm not even going to joke about this because it literally blows my mind. How do you... How do you not know that Asian porn exists? Like, that is a lot of people. A lot of people. And Vince just thought that this demographic had never needed nor thought about making pornography? It's insane. Even Jim Ross seemed bemused when Vince revealed this information to him. I mean, here's the quote. I remember Vince said, You want to hire this Asian girl, right? I don't know. I just don't know. And I said, Well, Vince, you know, there's a lot of guys that like Asian women, there's Asian porn sites, and McMahon then responded, no, no, no way, get out, as if he couldn't believe such a thing as Asian porn could exist. I have no words, apart from, Vince, that's mega racist. Number 9. He suspended Titus O'Neil for messing around with him on television. Perhaps one that you knew but forgot about or simply missed thanks to how the footage nearly never made it to air, but this random act of frivolity cost Titus O'Neil 60 days' work and a WrestleMania payday in 2016. The roster, including McMahon, had just clapped off a retiring Daniel Bryan to a teary end to a pre-show of show's edition of Monday Night Raw, and as the chairman was leaving, you can see Titus grab his arm, which then gets furiously shoved away. Now, for ages, we never knew the real reason as to why either happened, but it turns out that Titus was trying to get Vince's attention to let Steph go first out of the arena. Now, this act of strange chivalry cost the primetime player a primetime payday, and he's been slipping and tripping ever since. Coincidence? Well, yeah, probably because Vince can't remember who he books each week, but you know what, that's a different story. Number 8. He tried to sign Hulk Hogan and Macho Man Randy Savage in 1996. In the very same year that he bantered them off with the poorly received billionaire Ted Skitt, Vince McMahon tried to sign both Hulk Hogan and Randy Savage back in 1996, right as the former had become the hottest star in the industry again and the latter had potentially worn out his babyface welcome in Atlanta. Hogan claimed McMahon offered him $5 million to return and win the 19 1997 Royal Rumble, with Savage coming along as part of a deal that may have dented WCW's surging momentum. This, of course, could be grandstanding from the Hulkster, of course, and that would be of no surprise at all, but it is pretty shocking just to see how badly Vince wanted to stay on top by any means. However, this wasn't the only re-signing that he tried to wangle. Number 7. He tried to sign Ultimate Warrior in 1997 In the wake of the Montreal screw job, McMahon was desperate to get some star power back on the roster, and because of there's one thing that Vince loves, it is crap that he was plying years before and so he was utterly ready and willing to welcome back the Ultimate Warrior to the company in 1997. As you can see from the image on screen, it was a, well let's just say, pretty generous offer to try and sway the face-painted man back to the company, but it was ultimately declined however, and what we got instead was the train wreck that was Warrior in WCW. Oh good. Number 6. He met with Bret Hart just three years after the Montreal screw job. Now, post-1997 tensions did cool for real between Bret Hart and Vince McMahon after the chairman made a personal call to him after his stroke in 2002, but the pair also met up once before in secret to ease tensions following Owen Hart's tragic death in 2000. As Hart put it while speaking to the New York Post in November that year, his rep was begging me to meet with Vince and I already knew I couldn't talk about the impending lawsuit. It was best to say nothing. Finally, I said, OK, meet me in a park near my house. The pair made a loose agreement about Brett gaining access to photos and footage from his career, but nothing concrete came beyond that until Hart's surprising return to the fold for a DVD project in 2005. 
Number five, he cares more about certain talents' birthdays than family ones. I mean, this is just a bit silly that the chairman will send a heartfelt message to top-drawing figure John Cena, but a stock message to his own bloody son. However, it probably does explain why Shane probably jumps off so many things in order to get Father Dearest to notice him. And yes, I do know that his social media team is likely run by a team, but how Vince is that? Number four, he ran an illegal booze racket. Hey, so you know what we've not spoken about in a while? Playboy! So let's get back to that interview and see what other mad stuff Vince was doing. In 2001, he strangely admitted to peddling dodgy booze, seemingly trying to get around a prohibition law in his North Carolina state that was overturned decades before. See what I told you? I told you before, he's always behind the curve. He had this to say on the matter. I ran a load of moonshine in Harlow, North Carolina in a 1952 Ford V8. That was a badass car at the time, and I got paid a fortune. I think it was 20 bucks. Brilliant. Number three, he didn't know what a burrito was, but ate them all the time. As revealed by ex-WWE writer Dan Madigan, Vince McMahon nearly nixed a spiked burrito angle between Eddie Guerrero and The Big Show because he believed that no one would get the reference. Following that moment, he put some ketchup on his burrito. As he explained, the whole concept was, we're going to spike his food, spike the burrito, you cut to a vignette before showing him eating it, and then he passes out in the ring. And Vince goes, burrito? Who the hell knows what a burrito is? It's such a far concept, and everyone in the room goes, well, we know what a burrito is. And Vince goes, well, where the hell have I been? But the funny thing is, every day at noon, Vince's secretary would walk into the room, the writing room, with a burrito. It was a steak wrap cut in half, and he would put ketchup on it every day. He was eating a burrito and not knowing what it was. Number two, he killed Dracula for Shane. Vince McMahon allegedly only functions on about two hours of sleep a night. Now, most people would think that that would drive you insane. And again, I referenced that time that he tried biting through a bar for a magazine photo shoot. But clearly, he thought that this was a skill that his young son Shane should develop as well. He dropped this zinger to, you guessed it, Playboy in 2001. Linda would always read to the kids at night. I'd make up stories for them and my stories were full of action. Couldn't help it. I'd tell them a story, kiss them goodnight, and then they would be absolutely wired. Linda would have to come calm them down. So Shane was scared one night. He thought that Dracula was in his closet. I said, oh yeah? Watch this. I went into that closet and started growling and yelling, having a battle. I threw a little furniture. Now Shane's really scared to death until finally as dad walks out of the closet, I said, son, you never have to be worried about Dracula again. Dracula is dead. And Shane never slept again because that was bloody weird, Vince. And number one, he didn't realize that he'd be the heel after the Montreal screw job. Truly, there's an argument to be made that the events of late 1997 were some of the luckiest to occur in Vince McMahon's life. It's a horrible thing to say as it nearly cost one man a legacy, but all of this happened to work out very well for Vince, and none of it was planned. McMahon earnestly felt as though the infamous Brett screwed Brett line and interview with Jim Ross would result in loyal WWE fans siding with him. Oh, how wrong he was. On his Something to Wrestle podcast, Bruce Pritchard revealed the motivation, with Vince Russo, Jim Cornette, Ross and others all eventually chiming in backstage to confirm that yes, you were in fact the bad guy, Vince. Pritchard said, I know Vince felt that this was a babyface promo. 100% Vince looked at it as a babyface promo on his part because he was explaining to the audience, I did this for you, I did this for all the superstars, for the WWE, and I did this for you, the audience who supported us. Brett didn't want to do the time on a tradition and do what was right. So in Vince's mind, he's telling the audience, hey guys, in order to continue to bring you the entertainment we do every week, this is why I had to do what I had to do. But Brett made me do it. I think the rest speaks for itself. And there we go, those were 25 things that you didn't know about Vince McMahon. I hope that you enjoyed that, my friends. I know it's a bit of a longer list this time round, but I hope that you stuck through it because, my God, there's some weird stuff about that man. But you know what? Whatever you think about him, he's a legend, for good or for worse. And you, my friend, listening to this today, you are also a bloody legend because you deserve love, happiness, and success. Don't let anyone tell you any differently. And if you're struggling to achieve those three goals, then do not worry because a lot of people out there do need a helping hand every once in a while. Friend, family, and professionals in the support industry all care about you and want you to do well. The reason I say this is because much like Vince being a legend in the WWE, you should be a legend in your own life. So go out there and absolutely crush it. As always, I've been Jules. You can go follow me at RetroJ with a zero over on Twitter. You have been awesome. Never forget that. And I'll speak to you soon. Bye.